Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about peri periodic paths on the Pentagon. Uh, this is joint work with Samuel Lelievre and Barack Weiss, both of whom were here earlier but are not here now. Um, so here we go. So here's the plan. Our goal, my goal, is to understand periodic billiard trajectories on the Pentagon, of which you see several examples here. And the, my plan is to explain all the answers on the square, for the square billiard table and the square torus, where things are familiar, um, and then extend those same methods to the Pentagon, where things are you know, more complicated. So that's the idea. So here we go. So periodic directions on the square torus and the square billiard table are directions that have slope p over q, so rational slope. Um, if you have p over q in lowest terms, then uh, the period is just p plus q. So the way you can think about this is uh, slope is rise over run. This thing rises three times. This one is slope three-fifths. And it runs five times. So it hits the top edge three times and the right edge five times. So the period, which is the number of times it hits the edges, is just p plus q. Pretty good. Now, if we make this into a billiard table, um, everything sort of just doubles. And now every hit to all the sides is counted. So we have two times p plus q because we're counting all the sides. So the combinatorial period, which is the number of times the ball hits the sides, is just 2 times p plus q, as long as your fraction is in lowest terms. Great. So um, periodic directions, we also want, so periodic directions on the square are those uh, with rational slope p over q. And so you might, might want to know, like, what's the saddle connection direction for so the square torus in that direction? Again. Pretty easy to do. You can just draw this as a vector between two lattice points and see that the saddle connection vector is q comma p. q comma p. So there we go. So um, our goal is to answer these same questions for the pentagon. So here I've written the questions in black, and then I've just written the answers for the square uh, here in red. So what are the periodic directions on the regular pentagon? And then once we know them, for a given periodic direction, maybe your favorite periodic direction, uh, what's the saddle connection vector in that direction? Um, and then, what is the combinatorial period of the pentagon billiard trajectory? So if you hit your ball in that, that direction, which we know is periodic, how many times will it bounce before it comes back? And then, whatever the associated translation surface is for the pentagon, what's the associated period for that surface? OK, so that's what we want to know for the pentagon. And uh, so the plan, the way we're going to do this, is to put a tree structure on the periodic directions of the regular pentagon. Um, so first, I'll put a tree structure on the periodic directions for the square, so you see how it's done. And then we'll do it for the pentagon. That's the plan. OK. So another, one way to think about periodic directions on the square is that they are uh, directions that go from a center of a square to another center of the square, where you kind of unfold the squares in this way, so that the path is always inside um, some unfolded squares. And we can generalize this notion for the pentagon. Um, the periodic directions on the pentagon are those with vectors con uh, connecting centers of pentagons, where you unfold the pentagons along the edges in such a way that the vector or the path is always contained in those pentagons. So it's, it's a sum of fifth roots of unity uh, with this caveat that the path has to be able to be contained inside. OK, so done. We know what the periodic directions are on the pentagon. <laughs> Great. And now we can go on to trying to uh, do these other things, and we'll need the tree structure for that. OK, so a useful tool that we'll use is a shear. This is a horizontal shear. You may never have seen a shear in action, but this is what shearing does. A horizontal shear uh, where the line that's fixed is the horizontal, oops, oops, yeah, horizontal line containing this blue uh, edge here. Uh, so this is a video that I made to explain my PhD thesis result. This is one of my multivariable calculus students. Um, dancing on a translation surface that is getting sheared. OK, so this is a horizontal shear. So we're going to use a horizontal shear and a vertical shear. Um, these shears take the first quadrant to the blue sector for the horizontal shear and to the red sector for the vertical shear. And of course, there are many different uh, matrices that would do that. We pick the one with determinant 1. So it takes the two standard basis vectors, which are these black vectors here, to uh, the, the blue set of vectors. 1, 0, and 1, 1, and to the red set of vectors, uh, 1, 1, and 0, 0, 1. OK. Um, and we'll use these to generate every primitive lattice point and put a tree structure on them. So here's what we do. We start with our standard basis vectors, 1, 0, and 0, 1, and we apply both shears. And it turns out you just get one new point, this green point. Then we apply both shears to all the points we have so far, and we get these two new points. Then we apply both shears. Let's start with the red one to 
or to all the points we have so far, and we get these two new points from the red one, and these two new points from the blue one, and so on. So if we take all the points we have so far, and we apply the red shear, we get those four new points, and if we apply the blue shear, we get these four new points. And it goes on like that. So in the next stage, you would get a total of 16 new points. So if you notice, we got one, and then we got two, then we got four, then we got eight, and now we're getting 16. So it's creating a binary tree structure, and this process generates every primitive lattice point. So the way I like to think about that is that they're all the points that are visible for the origin. So here's the origin. We got two comma one, but we didn't get uh, four comma two because it's blocked in the origin by two comma one. So this gives us our lowest terms periodic directions, which are exactly what we want. These are the, uh, the periodic directions for the square. Um, it also gives every visible point a tree location. So if you pick your favorite point, maybe that yellow point up there, you can figure out how you got there with your shears. So if we assume we started everything at 1, 0, then to get there, we did uh, shear 1 from the red sector, shear 0, 1, 1, and 0. So it gives it, gives it this unique um, tree location, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. And we'll use that a lot. If you have your pentagon, it has a number on the bottom. Does it, who, who brought their pentagons? A lot of you have pentagons that I gave out. Um, it has a number on the bottom. It says something like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 short. That number is its tree location. And, and I'll explain that more in detail for the um, pentagon later. OK. So it also puts a tree structure on all the primitive points. So this is a tree. Every um, node has one thing coming in and two things coming out. Uh, it's, in this picture, it's kind of hard to tell that it's a tree, isn't it? You think you want to just like brush, get a hairbrush on there and make it easier to see. So I did that. Um, so here's the tree structure. Now you can see it's really a binary tree. So what we've done is um, kind of measured how com complicated each fraction is, like which level it comes up in this tree. And these are our lowest terms periodic directions. OK. So and then here you can see that yellow point. It had a, a tree location, oops, uh, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, to get there to our favorite point. Yeah, sorry? How close is this to the Yeah, it's, very, it's related to the fairy tree. It may be exactly the same as the fairy tree. Yes, exactly. It is the fairy tree, right? It is a, yeah, this is exactly the fairy tree. Yep. OK. So here's what we're going to do with it. Now, suppose you, shoot a billiard, you want to shoot a billiard ball in this direction of the vector 42 over 5, comma 6. Clearly a rational direction. But in order to figure out what the period is in that direction, you need it in lowest terms. Now, many of you have there a pencil and a piece of paper. You could just do it, figure it out in lowest terms. But we're going to use a geometric approach that will generalize to the pentagon. So here's what you do. You say, OK, I see that you're in the blue sector, sector 0. So I'm going to oops. So I'm going to apply the inverse of blue matrix. Now I'm in the red sector, so I'm going to apply the inverse of the red matrix. I'm still in the red sector, so the inverse of the red matrix. Now I'm in the blue, inverse of the blue. Now I'm in the red. I didn't tell you, but the sectors are closed at the bottom and open on the top. So right here, we're technically in the red sector. And that gets us down to the x-axis. And if you start with any rational direction, you'll eventually get down to the x-axis. And if you, these matrices are very simple. You, you apply them to your point, And you'll get, in this case, 6 over 5 comma 0. Now we wanted to get back to 1, 0. So all you have to do um, is scale everything by 5 sixths. And then you figure out what your um, saddle connection vector is in this direction. It's 7 comma 5. And so now if we want to know what the period is in this direction, well, it's 2 times 7 plus 5, which is 24. Pretty good. All right. OK. So now let's go to the pentagon. OK. So this is a pentagon billiard table. I've labeled the sides with different colors as is my custom. Um, and we're going to unfold it to get a translation surface. Question? Regular pentagon, yeah. For the purposes of this talk, every pentagon is regular. I believe Kurt's talk, not every pentagon was regular. But in my talk, every pentagon will be regular. OK, so we're going to unfold this until we get every edge having an opposite parallel buddy that it can be uh, glued to. So nothing so far. Nothing so far. OK, now these are um, glued to each other because they're parallel. The next one, the blue ones are glued to each other. The next one, the two purple ones are glued to each other. And also, the middle yellow ones have gotten a buddy. So this is how the gluing goes along around the thing. So if we finish it up, 
Um, every sort of exterior edge in this presentation is glued to the one that's uh, perpendicularly across from it, including the blue ones, which I didn't label. Um, and then in the middle, everything also perpendicular across to it. Um, this is a surface of genus 6. It has five vertices. And we call it the necklace because it looks like a necklace. So this is the translation surface associated to the, the Pentagon. OK, so we unfolded the Pentagon billiard table to this necklace. Um, but the necklace, I mean, it's a lot. It's got 10 pentagons. And it's a five-fold cover of just the double pentagon surface. And since I had already done a lot of work on the double pentagon, um, we decided to just use the double pentagon. And this works really well. So for the whole talk, it turns out the, the double pentagon will be pretty much all we need until the very end, when we'll have to use the necklace. So we project down uh, to the double pentagon, which is genus 2, and that'll be an easier surface to work with. OK, so that's the plan. OK, so this is the double pentagon surface. Um, it's two regular pentagons with every pair of parallel edges glued. And it gives us this translation surface. So again, this is a, a video I made uh, to explain my PhD thesis result. How many of you have seen this video before? Thank you. Good. OK. So, but it's so good, right? Yeah, someday I might, not be able to, I might not be able to put it in a talk, but that'll be a sad day. <laughs> what? Yeah, a singularity. Here she goes. Boom. <laughs> Thank you for asking. OK, so uh, the double pentagon has a friend, the golden L. Um, there is yet no video of someone dancing on a golden L, but it's created in the same way. So if, if Liz were to come onto the surface and she went across the orange edge, she would come out on the other orange edge and so on. OK, um, it, it, it's about the golden ratio. So it's an L-shaped table. Middle thing is a square. This dimension is golden ratio phi. And then this is 1 over the golden ratio. So this is a little golden rectangle. And that whole, this, uh, this whole thing here is a golden rectangle. And this little thing here is a smaller golden rectangle. So there's the golden L. Um, and uh, we work with these. These things are uh, affinely equivalent. So this is the mind-bending part of the talk, where you have to shear things with your mind. So if you take this picture on the left, and you shear it up like this with your mind, uh, and you make uh, this golden L into rectangles, you'll get the picture on the yellow picture on the right. And if you take the picture on the right and you shear it to the right, you can get regular pentagons out of it. You see? You see how they're the same? OK, cool. Um, we'll use the golden L because the angles are right angles, and that's easier. Yeah, OK. So this is joint work with Samuel Lelievre. Here are Samuel and I uh, sailing in Boston last summer. Uh, I'm an expert on the double pentagon. Samuel is an expert on the golden L. So we joined forces to, to make this thing happen. OK. So I had periodic directions on the square are those with uh, vectors connecting centers of, or, or corners of squares like this. And periodic directions on the golden L are those connecting corners of unfolded golden Ls. So unfolded squares and uh, little golden Ls. So what we're going to do is put a little, instead of putting a square in the corner of the first quadrant, we'll put a golden L. And instead of putting it into two sectors, we break it into four, four sectors. So the first sector is from slope 0 to 1 over the golden ratio. The next one is there to slope 1. The next one is there to slope phi. The next one is up to vertical. Um, and we pick, these are the shears that take the whole first quadrant to each of these sectors. And again, there are many choices. We pick the one with determinant 1, which means that they're the ones that take these standard basis vectors to these, these purple vectors that I've shown. So this first blue one takes a standard basis vectors to these two. The next one takes it to these two, and so on. OK. So we have this little golden L, and we use it to divide the first quadrant into four sectors now instead of two. So here's the idea. Suppose you start with a periodic direction. And you want to know, like, what's the period in this direction? Or what's the saddle connection vector in this direction? Anything you want to know, you're going to have to figure it out. So we, st we are find ourselves in the yellow sector. So we apply the inverse of the yellow matrix. We find ourselves in the blue sector. So we apply the inverse of the blue matrix. Now we're in the green. Apply the inverse of the green. Now we're in the red. So we apply the inverse of the red. What we're really doing here is that each of these um, matrices 
takes its associated sector, like for this green one, it's this green sector, and it stretches it out to the whole first quadrant. So it's kind of figuring out to more and more specificity what your angle is. You said, oh, to one level of specificity, my, my direction was in the yellow sector. OK, now stretch it out to the whole thing. Where are you now? Well, now I'm in the blue. Stretch that out to the whole thing. Where are you now? Well, now I'm in the green, and so on. So it's, it's more, more and more levels of specificity of where you are. And if you start out with a periodic direction, you'll eventually get something that's on the x-axis. So in this case, uh, by the way, this picture is not exactly to, this not to scale. Because these matrices actually stretch things quite a bit. Yeah, OK, great, yep. Um, yeah. So you'll eventually get down to this horizontal direction. This one, it was too short, so we'll need to stretch everything out by a factor. Um, so we'll, make, we'll stretch it. And then we can start with 1, 0 and just apply these matrices uh, directly and get uh, some point of the form a plus b phi, c plus d phi. Um, and you might be saying, hey, I know how to do matrix multiplication. I know that you're going to get phi to some higher power. Uh, but remember that if you take the golden ratio squared, you get the golden ratio plus 1. So anytime we get higher powers of phi, you can reduce them until it's something of the form um, a plus b phi, c plus d phi. OK. So the theorem is that this tree generates all the saddle connection vectors. And they're of the form a plus b phi, c plus d phi. So if you start with 1, 0, and you just apply any uh, order, ordering of any choice of these that you want, you'll get all the saddle connection vectors. In this case, in the first quadrant, but you could get the other quadrants as well. So there we go. We have the saddle connection vectors. Pretty cool. Um, it also turns out that this is like the right way to think about directions. Um, our theorem is that the double pentagon period in this direction, so if you go in this associated direction on the double pentagon, um, the, double, the period is 2 times a plus b plus c plus d all those vector coefficients. So I really like this because in the uh, square, if you had a direction of slope p over q, the period was uh, p plus q. And it's, so it's the same idea. You add up the vector coefficients, and in this case, you multiply by 2. So that's pretty exciting uh, because when we started this, we knew that for a, a periodic direction, there's not, uh, c there may not be a canonical way of expressing it. Uh, periodic directions are multiples of the golden ratio. But that means they're also multiples of square root of 5. So there's just lots and lots of ways of expressing something. And it turns out this is, in some ways, the best way of expressing it. Uh, because we can pull the combinatorial period right out of the, the vector representation. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Great. So uh, you might want to know why this is true. So the theorem is that the period in the double pentagon is twice the sum of the vector coefficients. Um, and it's a proof by induction. So you might be a bit uh, sad about a proof by induction. Have you ever heard that if you have a proof by induction, it means you don't really understand what's going on? Yeah, so I was a little sad that it was a proof by induction. But in some sense, we had to, because we use this tree structure. And so everything depends on the previous thing. And so a proof by induction is maybe not a bad idea. So the idea of the proof is that if you start with a horizontal trajectory, and then it, it satisfies this property, that the period is twice the sum of the vector coefficients. And then if you apply any of the transformations, the matrices, or the combinatorial operation, it preserves the property. So there you go. So we have a vector part. So, so the base case is uh, that we have the 1, 0, the horizontal direction. Here, of course, the sum of the coefficients is 1, 1 plus 0. And then over the same part is if you have a horizontal trajectory, it goes like, Yellow edge, green edge, and then back to yellow edge. So I call that like yellow edge, green edge, period is 2. So of course, this 2 is twice 1, so the base case works. Um, and then if it's for the vector part, we start with 1, 0, and then we apply one of the matrices. So I'm just going to do an example, but trust me, it works out for all of them. So if we were to apply the green matrix, for example, uh, to 1, 0, we get phi comma 1. OK, that's our direction. And then similarly, if we were to apply the green combinatorial operation on our uh, uh, cutting sequence, well, we started with one, two, or one, uh, green and then yellow, which 
the notation, which I won't go into, is I, uh, one and then two with this extra decoration that tells you where you're going. I am one, I'm going to two. I am two, I'm going to one. So these are the two symbols. And we apply this uh, substitution on the symbols. So we started out with symbol one, two. It tells you you should uh, do three, four, and then four, five. So that's here, these two symbols. And our second symbol is two going to one. Two going to one is this, five going to four, four going to three. So that's here. OK, so our new sig sequence is three, four, five, four. OK, so the idea is that we started with a horizontal trajectory. With sum of coefficients one, we applied a matrix. The green operation, a sum of coefficients is two. And then similarly, we started with the horizontal trajectory. We applied the associated combinatorial operation to the cutting sequence. And we got this new sequence, um, which is associated to this direction. Um, and the period is four. And I can tell you that if you work this out, it works no matter if you, which one you start with and which operation you apply. So that's the idea. Yeah. All right. All right. So here are our goals. We wanted to know what the periodic directions were. We did that. And then for a given periodic direction, we wanted to know what's the saddle connection vector in that direction. And we figured out you just start with one zero, and then you apply um, a bunch of shears to get what you want. And then what's the combinatorial period in that direction? Well, it's just the sum of the vector coefficients times two. So that's good. Um, we also wanted to put a tree structure on the periodic directions, and we did that. So the only thing left to do is to figure out what the uh, period is for the actual pentagon, our shape that we really like, the pentagon billiard table. So let's do that. Um, so our tree structure allows us to draw pictures of trajectories in various periodic directions. So here's a tree. And just to remind you, this is what it means. So we start, for example, with um, three, then we do one, and then zero, and then two, and then we get this direction. So that's where this is in the tree, and you might wonder what this looks like. It looks like this. Pretty nice, right? Yeah, so this is, this is the thing in direction three, one, zero, two. Um, here's one in direction one, zero, two. Pretty nice. Here's one in direction one, three, zero. Um, do I know which ones ahead of time are five-fold symmetric? It's not easy to see it from the tree word, but you take the tree word, like 101, and you run it through this, the um, directed graph of the each group of the necklace, and we know which ones, which uh, group elements, which uh, images of the surface have symmetry and which ones don't. Yeah, so we can do it. Yes? Is this trajectory starting? This, oh yeah, all the on my pictures are starting at the midpoint of an edge. Um, yeah. Yep, because then they're very symmetric and beautiful. And this one. Good. OK, so if you have um, a pentagon, one of these little ones that I've given you over the last couple of days, uh, look at the number at the bottom. And it says something like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0 short. Well, that, that number is its tree location. So now you know. Pretty neat. OK. OK, so now I'll talk about parallel trajectories. It turns out in every direction, there are two trajectories, a short one and a long one, because the double pentagon has two cylinders, a short one and a long one. So for example, for this trajectory parallel to an edge, um, there are two cylinders, which I've drawn in red and blue. If we have a, a trajectory in the short cylinder, this is a periodic trajectory on the double pentagon surface. And when we fold it into a pentagon trajectory, um, we get this beautiful pentagon. On the other hand, if you take one parallel to the long cylinder, here's what happens when you fold it, and you get this long one. So this is an example uh, following up Kurt's question about where the trajectory started. These tra for these trajectories, I didn't start it at the midpoint. So you can see what happens if you don't start it. If you start it just a little bit off from the midpoint, you get kind of a double trajectory going around. Um, and, and so I like to think of these as the canonical uh, two parallel trajectories, the pentagon and the star. So here are some examples of short and long trajectories in various directions. So here's the first one. So we have the pentagon and the star. Um, and you can see that they have parallel parts. All their parts are parallel. So there you go. Here's another example. Um, these ones, they also have parallel parts. So I've drawn the long trajectory on the left, then the short trajectory on the right, and then I've superimposed them at the top. 
Um, and a nice thing about them, actually, is that where one of them has a kind of a hole, the other one tends to have a lot of stuff, just because uh, one, one is the core curve of one cylinder, and the other is the core curve of the other cylinder. So it's not like a theorem, it's just uh, tends, where one tends to be a lot, the other one tends not to be, because if one of them is there a lot, like this, it means all of the sh uh, short cylinders are coming through this place, so it makes it less likely that a lot of the long cylinders are coming through there. And so you can see where I've posed them together, uh, they fill it up uh, more evenly when you put them together. So here's another one. Beautiful, right? And this one. I think this is the one that um, Samuel had printed out. So if you'd like copies of this one, they're over here. This one. And uh, this one, you might think for this one that they're not that similar. The one on the left doesn't look too much like the one on the right, right? They don't look like they should be fraternal twins. Uh, but if you look at it, they all have these spikes coming through them. Um, so they have a sort of family resemblance that might not be obvious unless you look at them closely. Um, and then here are some asymmetrical ones. Superimposed. This one's kind of nice because you can see that they have the nice parallel trajectories there when you put them together. Uh, so if you have your pentagon with you, you'll notice it has a number and then the word long or short. Now you know. You have either the long trajectory or the short trajectory in that direction. Yeah. Okay, so this is something that I sort of brushed under the rug when I told you they were theorem initially. So in a given periodic direction, the double pentagon period is 2 times a plus c plus d for the short trajectory. So the long trajectory, it turns out, is not as easy to figure out. We don't have a formula for it yet. Um, it's, it's an integer that's about the golden ratio times as long as the one that we know precisely. So that's kind of a, a bit of a mess because the golden ratio isn't a, an integer. Yeah, OK. So let's talk about symmetry. Saul asked about symmetry. Let's talk about it. So there's two types of symmetry on the, uh, on, for billiard pack. One is that it has only reflection symmetry, and the other is that it have the, has the full dihedral group symmetry of the pentagon. So reflection and five-fold rotation, like this one on the right. Um, so if you're going to have only reflection symmetry, it's because when you fold it up, uh, what you see is what you get, I guess. So here's a trajectory with period four on the double pentagon, and we'll fold this so it's a period for it's a periodic trajectory because it gets back to where it started. This edge is parallel to this edge, and this distance is, is the same as this little distance, and so it's periodic. And when we fold it up, choop, 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 to get a periodic trajectory, we get back to where we started. So that means that the period on the double pentagon is the same as the period on the billiard table. Okay? And so this, this trajectory over here, by the way, you might think that it has period two, but it actually has period four. It bounces back and forth like this. Um, on the other hand, suppose you have this, this trajectory. This has period two on the double pentagon because it gets back to the same place on this same parallel edge. But when you fold it up, it isn't back to where it started. So we have to, have to, have to do it five times to get back to where it started, and that's where we get this five-fold rotational symmetry. So in this case, you have to multiply the double pentagon period by 5 to get the billiard period. OK. So here's another example. When we take this period 4 thing, double pentagon, we fold it up. We get this thing, which clearly the ball would keep going. And so you have to do five copies of it to get the actual billiard trajectory. On the other hand, here's one of period 6 on the double pentagon, where when you fold it up, you just get a closed orbit already. So they're pretty neat. And these ones is where it's equal. So, so this answers our last question. What's the combinatorial period of the pentagon your trajectory? And the answer is you take the double pentagon period, you multiply by 1, or you don't do anything if it's asymmetric, and you multiply by 5 if it's symmetric. Um, and as I mentioned, you can figure out from the tree word which one it is by using the Veach group of the necklace. And you can figure out whether it lands on a surface that, where it has the symmetry or where it doesn't have the symmetry. OK. I guess we're done with everything we wanted. So what do you do when you're done with like doing all the hard work? Profite! <laughs> you just play with it and you can have fun. So for the rest of the time, we get to have fun. <laughs> OK. 
So for example, I'll just show you a bunch of pictures. I'm kind of biased towards symmetric or, or D5 symmetric, rotationally symmetric trajectories. So to uh, balance that out, I'll show you some asymmetrical trajectories. So this one, again, the same color scheme. This one is the short trajectory in this direction. And this one is the corresponding long one in the same direction. So you know I hand out pentagons, and I, I give you a, a choice. And I like to think of, of it as sort of a Rorschach test. Um, what, which trajectory you pick determines something about your psychology. <laughs> so you know, some of these are nice. Some of these are really nice. You can think about which one you picked. What if someone picked this as their favorite trajectory? Then what would you think? Yeah, OK. So, um, yeah. When you see each of the trajectories, do you recognize whether it's short or long? Wait, so the question was, if you, if you see a picture of a trajectory, can you, can you recognize whether it's short or long? And uh, no. <laughs> nope. I mean, unless I am familiar with it, like the star and the pentagon. But no, I don't think there's a way. Good question. OK. So um, if you were here before the talk started, you probably saw this video going of a bunch of cool trajectories. And those are families of trajectories, which is what I'll talk about now. So um, remember, back a few minutes ago, uh, using two shears, the blue shear and the red shear, the horizontal and the vertical, we put a tree structure on periodic directions on the square. Uh, and then we use that to uh, put a tree structure on all those uh, lowest terms fractions and then we did the same thing for the pentagon, and we put this tree structure on the direction. So I'm just reviewing this so you remember what these numbers mean. Um, so here's the tree structure and direction vectors. Actually, here it is. So here's the tree structure in direction vectors. So if you start with the horizontal direction, 1, 0, this is what happens if you apply each of the four matrices. So if you apply a horizontal shear to a horizontal thing, it stays in the same place. And here's what happens if you apply any of the others. And then when you apply the others, you get these things. OK, well, this isn't a very illustrative slide, really. Uh, but it's better if we replace them with pictures. Pretty nice, right? So if we start it, we start it with a horizontal trajectory that gives us just the, the pentagon or the star, but I'm showing the short trajectory here. And then if you apply each of the three shears, um, non-trivial ones, we get these pictures. Um, and when I made this tree, which I didn't do so early in the process. I did it eventually. I was actually making an info sheet about my Pentagon jewelry when I made this tree. And we realized that the tree is left-right symmetric. You see that? This same trajectory is all the way on the right, although it's created. This one is second from right, and so on. So the thing is actually symmetric. And then we were able to prove that um, basically because of the symmetry of the, the shears, that the these two shears are symmetric with each other, and the ones in the middle are symmetric with each other. That's basically the idea. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Um, and then if you go further out in the tree, you can get even more beautiful things. So for instance, the one that I'm wearing around my neck, or on my ears, or on my uh, shirt, <laughs> uh, you can go further out in the tree. But uh, this, this four-valent tree, it's like very bushy. You'll notice that I only made one branch to here. If I had made more, you know, it would, be, it would be very bushy and you wouldn't be able to see anything. So it's hard to know where really to look in the tree if you want to find something interesting. You can't really just look at it because there's just so many branches. Um, so I made this website where I just dumped the, all the trajectories from the first four levels of the tree onto this website. So if you're looking at the, the trajectory, uh, the tree location, this number, it's up to length four. So I made this whole web page for them. Actually, I was sending it to people and saying, just Tell me which is your favorite trajectory. Um, because I noticed, as you may have noticed, that these pictures are really beautiful. And so I wanted to bring them to the people, you know? Um, so I wanted to make jewelry, these necklaces, these earrings. But there are infinitely many uh, periodic trajectories. And I couldn't, make in, you know, I couldn't have infinite inventory. So I wanted to figure out which ones people like the best and then just make those, right? So my idea with this website 
was I would just send this link to people, and then they would tell me like which one were their favorite or which ones were their favorites. It's pretty good, but it's very long. Um, this website has 500 or so pictures on it. And so I was worried that maybe there would be lots of different people saying different ones. I'd have to make 20 different designs. Um, but in the end, for this is earring size, the size I have on my ears and that Andrea has on her ears too. Um, and only about 10 had a few enough pieces that they could be reasonably made into earrings. So I have a question. Which one is your favorite? OK, so for all of you, I mean this. Look at this picture and decide which one is your favorite. They're the same in vertical rows, basically. Pick a favorite. Can we vote for two? Uh, you just pick a favorite. Like if, so the idea is I walk up with you to, this, to you with this sheet, and I say, hey, you can have whichever one you want. Just pick whichever one you want. Here, take it. Right? I've done this a bunch of times. I, you can have two earrings, yeah, for your two ears, yeah. OK, so I, I hope that you are seriously picked a favorite. OK, with a show of hands, how many of you picked this one? Yeah, pretty good, thank you. OK, so it turns out that about... <laughs> Every time I try this, like 50% of people pick this same one. Um, and when I gave them 500 choices on this website, about 50% of people still pick the same one, whether it's 10 choices or 500 choices. When I, also, when I was printing out these little guys to bring, I printed out twice as many of the associated trajectory to this kind, and I ran out first. <laughs> so if you have that trajectory, like, you're lucky. OK. So I mean, the, with respect to the Rorschach test, maybe we should say, I don't know, these people who all pick this, all of you who raised your hand, you all like get along well and are nice. And <laughs> the rest of you. <laughs> By the way, Andrea, wait, what earrings do you have? You have these. <laughs> you have these. <laughs> you do. Yeah, OK. <laughs> so, um, so one of them is a clear favorite. Uh, this is the one that we just picked for the earrings. It turns out that in the earring size made on wood with laser engraving, people pick this one. And actually, on the screen, with higher resolution, people pick this one that's very similar. And so I wanted to know, like, what's the, what is the deal, and how do I get more of them? Uh, because it would be nice. Like, I could make this trajectory, uh, the one that is already earrings in the audience, for the um, earrings. And then I could make this related trajectory for a necklace pendant. You only have the same trajectory in both places, but you could consider making different ones. And if I could only make a more complicated one, then I would have choices. So I wanted to figure out how to find the more complicated one. And through my profound powers of observation, I noticed that the tree location of this one is 1, 2, and the tree location of this one is 1, 0, 2. So I thought, what about more zeros? That would be good. And indeed, it works. So now I've moved 1, 0, 2 up to here to the earring position, and this one is the more complicated one. OK, so that's the idea. That's the, that's the teaser for families, is that somehow padding the middle with zeros makes similar trajectories happen. OK, so now we bring in Barak. So, this is, so, so that was the state of the art, and then I went to Israel. This is a picture from um, two weeks ago. We went on this hike. Yeah, great. Uh, we're at the, near the top of a mountain. So here's the insight. We, if we st suppose we start with the trajectory on the double pentagon surface. It has these four pieces. So this is a periodic trajectory. It, maybe we could say it starts here at the bottom. It goes up to there. Then it comes over to here, goes across to there, and then comes up to here and is periodic. So it has these four pieces. Um, if we give each piece its own pentagon, then we can fold it up into a pentagon trajectory. Doop, doop, doop. And then we can uh, do it five times to get the full trajectory. OK, so that's how we get trajectories uh, from double pentagon. So, so we get billiard trajectories from double pentagon trajectories. And here's the idea. We'll start with that same one with the four pieces, and we'll do a Dane twist in the horizontal cylinder. Ready? Twist, twist, twist. OK. So now we're going to take each of those and fold them up into billiard trajectories in the same way that I did for the first one. Give them each their own pentagon, and then fold them up. So here's what we get. Here's the first one. This is the one we constructed, period 20. Are you ready?
OK, wait, right. So this is, these are families of trajectories. You can see how they have this similarity among them. Um, and so the beautiful family, that's what I like to call it, the one that half of people like, um, is created in a similar way. And here I've put the tree word. So as I mentioned, the tree word for the first one is 1, 2. For the next one is 1, 0, 2. For the next one is 1, 0, 0, 2. And what we're doing, 0 is the horizontal shear. So that's the, the Dane twist in the horizontal cylinder. So that's what's happening. And then we're folding it up into a billiard trajectory. Ready for this one? So this is the one that some of you have. I believe you have some of you who were lucky enough to get them before they sold out. Have this one in your pocket. Isn't it pretty cool how it seems to recede into the distance? And it's avoiding the other, the other annulus? It's avoiding the other annulus? There's this light region. Yeah, there's this, exactly. There's this light region. So I think it's very beautiful because it turns out to look like this shading pattern. So you might wonder why, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But yeah, you can see it's this beautiful shading pattern. Um, and so going back to this website of periodic trajectories, one thing you might notice if you, if you go to this website is that when you scroll down, things get pretty boring. Um, because all the pentagons are basically just black. Now, some of them aren't. These are the ones that are asymmetrical. And that's because they have one as many segments, basically. So if we equalize things by, by multiplying them by 5 with the rotations, maybe they'd be black. Or if we just scroll down in the table, maybe everything would be black. Uh, so a conjecture from just looking at this library is that as the length of the path increases, periodic billiard trajectories equidistribute in the pentagon, whatever that would mean. Now, it's periodic, but I think you understand the idea of equidistribution. It would, it would kind of fill in everything the same. But it has to be false, because check this out. Clearly not equidistributing, this one because of this light region, this light annulus. Um, yeah. So, um, but with Barak, uh, we showed that as the length of the path increases, periodic billiard trajectories equidistribute in cylinders. Or in other words, there's a measure that converges to Lebesgue in each cylinder. Um, and for the double pentagon, you can have different proportions in each cylinder. For uh, a surface such as the uh, Ayer Legenda uh which has one cusp, then it will be the same of both cylinders. But we are lucky, and we have this, this one that can have different percentages in each cylinder. If you take two copies of which? Ah. If you start the two trajectories very close together, I'm not sure that they would equidistribute. Oh. Yeah, if, if you had one that was the core curve of the long cylinder and one that was a core curve of the short cylinder, I think then you might. I think in uh, complementary ways. So if one is completely in the short cylinder, the other one will be completely in the long cylinder. If one is 30, 70, the other one will be 70, 30, I think. If it's 50, yeah, when you add them together, I think it's 50, 50. Yeah. So um, what's happening here is that the double pentagon path is filling in one cylinder. So this isn't the horizontal cylinder. It's the cylinder in the other direction. But we're filling it in more and more and more and more. And now, once we've filled it into whatever we want, uh, we stamp it around. So what I mean by stamp it around is you take one of these, just one, because they're, as you can see, they're identical. Take one. And now imagine this is a stamp, and we want to have it in all five orientations. So here's the, like, the vertical stamp. Then we need a stamp in this direction. And then the stamp coming from the top right. And the stamp coming from the top left. And then the stamp coming from the left. And there it is. Basically the trajectory that we had. So it's not equidistributed. It has this light annulus. And now you know exactly why. It's because it comes from these two white strips um, just adding up. And from this, you can also, you might wonder, like, what were the proportions of shading in each region? And you can just count how many line families you get. So for this extra light region, you can see there's two, two line families. For this one, three. And then for the dark part in the center, all five. 
Um, so it's not equidistributed, distributed, but it is very beautiful. OK. I'll remind you, changing gears just a little bit, of optimal dynamics, previously known as the Veach dichotomy. So if a table has optimal dynamics, it means that every trajectory is either periodic, like this one on the left, or equidistributed, like this one on the right. Yeah, I like to make this picture as a joke, but the good. Thank you for laughing. OK. <laughs> So um, when I was first learning about this, I wondered what could you possibly have? It would be non, like what's, what's the alternative? So not, an example of non-optimal dynamics would be a trajectory that's dense in one region and that misses another completely. So this is uh, Kurt's example from his website. Um, it's a L-shaped table made from a square with a rectangle put on the side. And in this particular direction, it fills in densely, but it misses those corners. And so when I saw this, I thought, wow. He must have been really smart to come up with this example of this happening. Um, wasn't wrong. Um, but I thought, you know, it must be a really special example, like a really specially constructed table. This must be like a special irrational parameter. This must be a special length. It would be really tough to find something where this happened. Um, so what do you think? Can, what about like a, a really nice, beautiful shape like the Pentagon? Do you think you could get this kind of behavior? No. But. Basically, you can. And this was really surprising. So, so not in this case, because of course the pentagon is a, is a table with optimal dynamics. But if we look at longer and longer periodic trajectories, we can get something like that behavior. So check it out. This is an asymmetrical family. Uh, this has tree location 1, 2, 3, 1. And um, we're going to twist it in the vertical cylinder. So I'm going to pad the middle with threes. Ready? Here we go. OK, so I put an extra three in. Put an extra three in. Here we go. Pretty convincing, huh? So these are long. These don't violate the optimal dynamics because they're all periodic trajectories. So they fall into the periodic trajectory category. But they kind of seem like they do because they're increasingly long trajectories that fill in the entire table arbitrarily densely, except they miss this corner. So it's pretty cool. And some of you have that one, some one of those in your pocket too. So. Um, I'm still working on this. I want to understand the mechanism. Obviously, the stamping around method where you take something and you take five rotations of it that we did for the other, the beautiful trajectory, doesn't work here. Um, so I want to know how this works. And this is where actually the double pentagon, using the double pentagon breaks down. I'm going to have to go back to the necklace. So at the beginning, I said the unfolding of the, of the pentagon is the whole necklace. But we don't really have to work with the necklace. We can use a much simpler double pentagon. And here, we're actually going to have to go back to the necklace to understand what's going on. So I'm currently working on that. So, so just before you answer, the limits yeah. is then black and the, the thin annulus? The limit of this is, yeah. is black here, for sure. It has like five out of five. Trajectories are, or I don't know, whatever. The full proportion of trajectories are here. But there's no annulus here. Yeah. So the limit is not periodic. Is it periodic? The li well, this is, a this is a family of periodic trajectories. Then we take the, the limit. Oh, in the limit, by the way, uh, these are all approaching horizontal. Uh, or these are all per approaching perpendicular to an edge. So you can see, if you look at one, I mean, you can see that these all look like the resolution is not so high, maybe, but they all look like they're perpendicular to this edge. And you can barely even see that it's coming in and coming out. It just looks like a single line. Uh, but it's actually a trajectory coming in and coming out. So these are all, they're approaching, um, because I was uh, doing th padding the middle with threes, we're twisting in the vertical direction. And so uh, it's becoming closer and closer to the vertical direction, which is perpendicular to an edge. So in the limit, it's periodic. Uh, simple trajectory that's just vertical trajectory. Yeah. In the limit, it's a very simple trajectory. Um, so I want to understand the mechanism to go from trajectories on the, on the necklace to these asymmetrical billiard paths. You might wonder what this thing looks like on the double pentagon. And amazingly, well, it looks like that. I had the computer draw it. And this is not white. So this goes back to Christopher's question. 
Um, these are in proportion, I don't know, something like 70%, 30%, maybe. Um, but when you fold them up, somehow you get much denser and then nothing, zero. So I would like to understand that. I'm working on it. Um, and then I'd like to understand why trajectories of symmetry are more common. Now, we have a proof. It involves the, uh, the Veach group of the necklace. Actually, I'm pretty happy with it. But I want to, you know, like... Uh, one sixth of trajectories have just bilateral symmetry, and five sixths of them have this uh, rotational symmetry as well. And, and everybody notices that. When you look at the table of them, people notice that these, these guys with the rotational symmetry are more common. And people say, oh, why are they more common? And to you guys, I can say, well, you know, there's uh, six places in the orbit of the necklace under the Veach group, and five of them have rotational symmetry and one doesn't. But it doesn't work so well for like the person on the street. So I want like a snappy explanation. Why are these five times more common? Oh, because it's the Pentagon, multiply by five. I wish that were the explanation, but I'm not sure about it yet. So I, I would really like to have a snappy explanation for that. Um, and then the last thing that we'd like to do is just understand billiard trajectory behavior. So for instance, um, every uh, periodic billiard trajectory has an even period. So which even numbers arise as a, peri as a, as a period in the pentagon? Uh, we've proved that every multiple of 10 arises as a symmetric billiard trajectory period. So that's good. But how about does every even number greater than 2 arise? Here's 4 through 10. Uh, but we'd like to understand that. And if so, why? Um, and then also, if so, given an even number, how many of them have that period? So what's the growth rate of, of these numbers? So just for some fun examples, these two both have periods 16, 40, 64, 110, 120. OK, so at least there's two for some of them. Um, and then just looking at the pictures, there are lots of things we'd like to know. So people always ask me, uh, Diana, what's with the holes? Like, like why are there holes? Thing. What's with this hole? I don't know. I mean, I can tell you that if this is, going back to Anton's question, I don't know if this is the short or the long trajectory, but whichever one it is, its, it's parallel friend probably has some dense bit here. But otherwise, I, ha I can say nothing about the holes. I don't know. Um, why are, yeah. So here are some other ones with holes. Pretty neat, huh? The holes are nice. Here are some other ones with holes. This is similar to my shirt. Yeah. So I'd like to understand that. Um, and, and any other questions that you could get from this library of beautiful pictures. All right, thank you.